Good afternoon and welcome to the latest episode in BioExcel's webinar series. Um, my name is Adam Carter. I'll be the host for today. Uh, I'm going to spend just two or three minutes talking a little bit about BioExcel in general and then I'm going to pass over to today's presenter, Matthew Con Conroy from Emble EBI, who's going to be talking about assessing structure quality in the PDB archive. Before I go any further, I should let you know that this webinar is being recorded, including the question and answer session at the end. Um, that means that uh, you will be able to view it again later on YouTube and from the BioExcel website if you're interested in uh, looking at it again later on. So I'll start by giving just a, a few words of introduction about the BioExcel project. Um, some of you may already know what we're doing, but for those of you who don't, um, this the BioExcel project is a project to establish a center of excellence in computational biomolecular research. Um, so there's three main strands to what this, this center will offer. Uh, we want to offer excellence in biomolecular software. So part of the project uh, is involved with um, three initial codes, including Gromax, Haddock, and CPMD. These are the codes that we're starting from in the project, and we have the code's core developers uh, as part of the project team. Um, but as, we, as the center broadens out, we will probably also look at other pieces of software as well. Another important aspect of what we do, as well as uh, having good software, we want to make sure that these things are easy to use in context. Um, so one of the things that we're trying to look at is workflow environments to make sure that these codes and others can be used um, more easily uh, as part of your research workflow. And the final part of the project is to do with consultancy and training. So um, we very much want to involve uh, the wider community in uh, the work of the project and the center as much as possible. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how you can get involved in a minute. Um, but we also uh, want to make sure that we are promoting best practice and training end users. One of the ways that we um, interact with the broader community is through interest groups. These are interest groups that you can join if you want to find out more about the work that BioExcel is doing and talk amongst other people who are working in these areas. So you can go to the main BioExcel website and join the interest groups from there. Um, some of these forum, uh, the things that we offer these uh, through these interest groups uh, include forums, um, video channels. Uh, we can also provide other things like code repositories and chat channels as well, if that's of use to the, the members of the interest group. Okay, um, so I'll shortly hand over to the presenter. I should just point out that there'll be an option to ask questions at the end. The best way to do this is for you to um, type your question into the questions area in your GoToWebinar control panel at the side. Uh, that makes sure that uh, I'll be able to see all the questions that have come in and I'll be able to pass them on to, to Matt at the end. Um, so uh, if, you're, uh, if you have a microphone and you're able to speak, we'll, I'll take the question directly, otherwise I can read it out to Matthew. Um, if, any, if you're watching this uh, later as a recording um, or you want to uh, our question occurs to you later, you can also ask questions through our um, forum at ask.bioexcel.eu. So now I'm going to hand over to today's presenter. Matthew Conroy is a scientific curator at EMBL EBI, working with the Protein Data Bank in Europe. And before joining PDBE, he was solving structures of proteins by X-ray crystallography, NMR, and electron microscopy. So, um, Welcome, Matthew. Thank you for presenting today. Uh, I can invite you now to, uh, to take control uh, and, to, um, and to show your slides. So I think uh, you can now take over. I can. Thanks very much, Adam. Thanks, Matthew. So thank you very much for joining this webinar today. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is give you a, a high-level overview to how you can judge, judge the quality of structures in the PDB archive. So, as we've said, I work for the Protein Data Bank in Europe. 
here at Amble EBI. Hopefully you're all familiar with the Protein Data Bank, but what we are is an archive of experimentally determined uh, 3D structures of bio biological macromolecules. Uh, so that means all the structures in the PDB have experimental data behind them. They have all come from wet biochemistry, uh, real life samples uh, to start with. And as the name of the protein data bank suggests, most of the molecules we have are structures of proteins, but there's also quite a lot of nucleic acid structures in there, some sugars, and a lot of complexes of proteins and nucleic acids together. We have many structures, like the structure on the right of the slide, of ribosomes, which are, of course, complexes, protein, and nucleic acids. The PDB is managed by an organization called Worldwide Protein Data Bank, WWPDB, which is formed of a consortium of four different organizations, uh, ourselves here in Europe, RCSB PDB in America, and PDB Japan in Osaka, Japan, uh, along with BMRB, which deals with NMR data. And together, we curate all the data that comes into the PDB archive uh, based geographically, so if you're a structural biologist solving structures anywhere in Europe or Africa, your data will be deposited to us here at Emerald EBI in Cambridge. And all four sites put, their, put the data into the common FTP archive, which is the PDB. So the PDB isn't a website, it isn't an organization, it's an FTP archive of data. And then all the different sites take that data from the archive and make it available to the public on our respective websites um, with different search systems, different value-added data put into it. If you're just looking for the basic data, it's the same on all sites, but the way you access it and the way it's viewed uh, may be different for each of the member organizations of the Worldwide PDB Partnership. As I said, all the molecules in the PDB are interpretations of experimental data, be it a very small molecule on the left, this copper scavenger, which is less than a kilodalton in size, um, to the really large molecule, Zika virus, which was uh, solved last year and deposited in the PDB of four megadaltons. And because they're experimentally determined structures, let's look at what the experimental data are, what are available. The vast majority of structures in the PDB are determined by X-ray crystallography. And the data uh, for X-ray crystallography are the structure factors, which are derived from the diffraction pattern. When you shine an X-ray beam at a crystal, it diffracts, and we collect that data. And since 2008, it's been mandatory, along with your model, the coordinates of the molecule, to deposit the structure factors in the PDB along with uh, the model. Around 10% of the structures in the PDB are solved by solution NMR spectroscopy. Um, and the data for NMR is the restraints, so the information that tells you which atom is close to which other atom, and the chemical shift data, so the frequency with which the atoms resonate. And they've been mandatory to be deposited with the model since 2008 and 2010, respectively. So you can see while the PDB has been going since 1972, actually depositing the data to support the model has come relatively late in the game. The other major method in the PDB, which is at the moment only 1% of the whole archive, but is a growing technique, is electron microscopy. And the data to support the model in electron microscopy derived structures is an electron microscopy map, which goes in our partner archive, EMDB. And while it's only been mandatory since last year to deposit the map in EMDB when you deposit the model in the PDB, actually around more than 1,000 uh, EM models in the PDB already have a map in EMDB anyway.
as in all scientific experiments, some data are better than other data, and some models, the structures in the PDB, which are interpretations of that data, are better than other models. So to take an example, here are two pictures of me. One of them is much better data quality than the other. The one on the left is clearly recognizable as me. The one on the right, if this was CCTV footage of a bank robbery, I fancy my chances of getting away with it. And some models are better than others. So if I asked an artist to uh, make a portrait of me based on that photograph, one of those images I will be more flattered with than the other. Although it's important to notice that they both contain data. Even the one that is less flattering of me contains some information. And for whatever you're doing, whatever your needs are, you need to find the best structure in the PDB for what you need to do and be aware of any potential limitations that there might be with what you're working with. And it's also important to note that the different experimental techniques for determining a structure have different strengths. There was a paper in TIBS at the end of last year by Joel Mackay et al. from Australia which was a, a very good paper. I'd recommend you reading it to get an overview of the, the limitations and the strengths and weaknesses of the different techniques used to determine structures in the PDB. And Joel Mackay said in that paper, structures are not absolute truths. Uh, they're models that fit the experimental data and therefore have uncertainty and subjectivity associated with them. And it's important to realize what those limitations are when you're dealing, working with a structure derived from the PDB. So with that, we have a poll. I'd like to know what you use the data in the PDB for or what you plan to use the data in the PDB for. I'm just going to put that poll onto the screen. Yep, there you go. So we've got about 45% voted, 64 voted. Okay, we'll leave it five more seconds and then I uh, can probably close the poll and post the result. Okay. So there's the results. Okay, Matthew, so it's, uh, yeah, yeah. it's, I can say, yes, it's evenly split, um, or roughly evenly split, quite a lot use it for homology modeling, uh, small molecule docking, and protein, protein interactions, and 14% something else. We will be intrigued what the something else is until the end. Okay, so it's important whatever you're doing particularly homology modeling and drug docking, are you starting with a structure that is reliable? What are we doing to validate data in the PDB? As I've stressed, all the structures are models explaining the data, <clears throat> but the PDB doesn't reject structures based on quality. We do give an indication of that quality. So there's no point in my job as an annotator that I can take a structure and say, this is just too bad. Because it's very difficult to draw the line of where bad is, as we might see later on. And this quote from George Box, he said, essentially all models are wrong, but some are useful. Now, he was talking about statistical models, he was a statistician, but I think that's uh, something useful to bear in mind looking at models in the PDB. All are, if not wrong, they're incomplete interpretations of the data. So what is the WWPDB, the organization that manages the PDB archive, doing to indicate structure quality? Well, there are validation task forces that are derived from the community that have advised us how we should validate structures. And their work is published, uh, all in the journal structure. 
There are four papers now for each specific method, X-ray crystallography, NMR spectroscopy, and EM, and another one on small molecule validation. And this task force from the community have advised us how best we validate the models in the PDB archive, so the coordinates and the positions of the atoms, the experimental data it's derived from, and how well the model agrees with the data. And what they're advised is we produce a validation report. This means most entries in the PDB now come with validation reports, which are PDF documents downloadable from each of the PDB partner sites uh, for you to read. And it's also in XML format for computer readability. So for each of the three main methods, X-ray, NMR, and electron microscopy, the report indicates the quality of the model. For X-ray and NMR, it also indicates the quality of the data and the fit of the model to that data, with the caveat, of course, of if the data were actually deposited, some of the earlier models, we just have the model, we don't have the supporting data. For electron microscopy, that information isn't yet in the report, but it is available here at EBI on our EMDB pages, and it will be added to the report in due course. So here on the left, this is what a, a typical front page of a validation report looks like. It gives you some information of the structure. This is one I determined, so I know I'm safe to put it up because only I can criticize it. Um, <clears throat> and these reports are available to download on all the PDB sites, and they're recalculated annually because, as we'll see later, it's... Um, they judge the quality of the structure relative to others. So as more structures are added, of course, the, uh, the position of a structure relative to the whole archive will change. The report is available to scientists who determine the structures when they deposit it with the PDB, um, and we're encouraging those authors to give it to the journal referees so when the paper's being published, the data quality can be assessed. And there's also a standalone server where people can upload their data to see what report we will give when it's deposited in the archive. That can also be used for modelers. You don't have to give experimental data, so you could throw your model at the um, standalone server to see how good the geometry is according to the criteria we assess them. So how do you get hold of these reports uh, from our pages? Well, this is a typical search result at PDBE. I search for HIV retropepsin, and you can see there are nearly 1,000 results, 990. And for each one, click this button, Download Files. There's a pop-up. You can download lots and lots of different files. Under Validation, there are all the reports. A summary PDF report and a full report. Uh, the summary one uh, only contains a little of the information. The full report is far more extensive. You can view those in the web page or download the file. And there are various graphics as well that we'll talk about in a minute, and the XML data if you want it to be machine readable. And similarly, not only from the search results, but you can download the report from each individual entry page. So each PDB entry has its own page, a series of pages at PDBE. This is a typical one for entry 2AZ9. On the right-hand side, there are these links, View and Download. So View lists a whole load of files. The reports are in there. Click on those. It will open it up in the web page. And similarly, the Download link has a whole list of files. And the reports are there to download uh, to your machine. What do the reports look like? They start with a, an overall summary of the structure, and then as you read more and more into the report, it gets more detailed. So it starts with the overall quality at a glance, and you'll be able, I'll talk about this in a minute. It follows on with residue property plots, so you can see each uh, residue in a polypeptide chain or in a nucleic acid chain highlights uh, the quality of those. And then further on, there are many, many tables in the report that give a detailed analysis of any potential issues. As I said, it starts with a summary. This is called overall quality at a glance. 
and over a series of different metrics, it tells you how good the structure is relative to other structures in the PDB archive. So, structure towards the, the blue end is in the very high percentile, towards the red end is in the very poor percentile, and you can see here, this is for an X-ray structure, the solid black bar tells you how good the structure is relative to all structures in the PDB solved by X-ray crystallography, and the open bar gives an indication of how the, how the quality compares to structures of a similar resolution, and we'll talk about resolution in a minute. So this shows you how good the structure is, or how, good, how well the structure compares to others in the PDB archive. It's important, however, to notice that because this is a comparison, poor ranking doesn't necessarily mean that the structure is bad. Um, it is in the nature of statistics that not everything can be above average. Someone has to be bottom of the class. So a structure that is more towards the red end may mean it's not just as right as others. There are justified reasons for outliers. Um, there are real reasons why bond lengths, bond angles can be in strange places. And it's important then to look if there, those uh, strange values are supported by the underlying data. We use this summary slider to rank search results at PDBE. So on our search results page, you will see that there is this two-bar slider. This is, if you like, a summary of the summary, and it takes into account those validation metrics and the resolution of the structure to rank all the structures in your search results by quality. And similarly, you can search, sort the results um, by the quality of the structure in the box at the top. So here in this particular search, there are over 500, nearly 600 different uh, structures. If you're unsure which one to use, this may be a very useful uh, filter to pick the one that's best for you. So what are the metrics we use in these uh, summary sliders, as we refer to them? For the geometric uh, assessment, we use software called Mole Probity uh, to assess how good the uh, polypeptide chain is or the nucleic acid chain. And we use this for all structures. It doesn't matter how they're determined. Uh, this is good because, of course, chemistry doesn't change no matter how you look at it. Um, a peptide bond is a peptide bond and has its the same geometry. It doesn't matter whether you study it by X-ray or NMR. That doesn't change it. So these metrics are clash score. This is how many atoms are bumping into each other. We know that two atoms cannot be in the same place at the same time. So if in the model two atoms are overlapping, there may be a problem there. And the clash score gives you an indication of how many atoms are bumping into each other. And on the far right, there's a value, and that's the number of atoms per thousand in the case of clash score. The other three metrics uh, list surprising bond angles, the Ramachandran outliers for the peptide backbone, uh, side chain outliers. We know, given the number of structures that are available in the PDB, that amino acid side chains typically sit in given conformations. If a side chain is sitting in an unusual conformation, then we'll mark that as an outlier. As I said earlier, it doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong, but it's statistically strange and worth looking at. And in the same way for RNA backbones, we know what conformations uh, occur typically. And these metrics in the black bars are relative to all structures, and in the case of this one, which is an NMR entry, relative to all NMR entries. So in each case, we give a comparison across the whole PDB and a comparison to similar structures. Of course, geometry doesn't mean it's right. A structure could be geometrically perfect, but that only tells you that it's chemically sensible. If we took the structure here on the left, and if that was geometrically perfect, that's fine, and the geometry is great. However, if the data suggests it looks like the structure on the right, then the geometric perfection counts for nothing because 
it doesn't fit the data and it's completely the wrong structure. And I've seen lots of people who do homology modeling and docking uh, make this assumption that if the structure is geometrically fine, that must mean it's right and that's not a valid assumption. For X-ray structures, there are two extra, metri extra metrics in the validation report, one of which is R3. This is, without wishing to go into the maths of crystallography, how well does the model back predict a small subset of the data? So if we take the model and then use the model to calculate what the data would look like, how close do the two things match? How close does the, the back calculated ideal data fit with the real data. And for this, lower values are better for macromolecular structures like proteins. A value of around 2, uh, 0.2 is typically what we'd expect. Somewhere between 0.15 up to 0.3 is a reasonable structure. Uh, for small molecule crystallography, you typically get down to 0 0.02, 0 0.05. Um, if that value is up around 0 0.5, 0 0.6, that's essentially random. So you could take any model and any data set and they would fit with that correlation. And the other metric for X-ray crystallography is RSRZ outliers. So these are residues not in the electron density. So individual residues which don't fit the data. Uh, the real space R value, RSR, measures the fit between uh, the model and the data for each amino acid. The Z-score is a normalization specific to the residue type and the resolution of the structure. So you can, we can ask the question, how well does this arginine fit the data compar in comparison to all the other arginines in the PDB? And we mark a residue as an outlier if the RSR Z-score is more than two. So we've talked about the fit to the data in X-ray crystallography, which is the vast majority of structures in the PDB archive. Let's have a look at X-ray data. From the diffraction pattern that we calculate from the crystal, we can calculate uh, what we call an electron density map. That indicates the locations of the electrons and, of course, therefore the atoms in the crystal. So from this uh, density map, we fit the model into the data. And the model is built into the map in an iterative process uh, for complicated mathematical reasons we won't go into. Uh, the closer the model is to the data, the better the model quality gets, the map quality gets. So it's an iterative process where one improves the other, which is why in the R3 section you take a small subset and don't do that with it so you can compare um, an unbiased value. The resolution of the structure indicates uh, how precisely you can fit the atoms into the electron density map. And the resolution is determined by how good your crystal is and how far it will diffract in an X-ray beam. So this structure is 3.7 angstroms. This is a heme group. And you can see that the electron density, the blue chicken wire, is somewhat blobby. If you didn't know that there should be a heme here, you may have difficulty identifying that it is a heme. But if you know you're expecting a heme there, you can put it in there with a reasonable degree of confidence that that's roughly where it should fit. We increase the resolution so we go to a lower number, 2.4 angstroms. Now we can see quite clearly the overall shape of the heme group, although there are some atoms which are still outside the density because the resolution isn't great and there's still um, a degree of uncertainty. Go to a higher resolution, still one and a half angstroms, we can see lovely holes in the middle of the tetrapyrrole ring and you can begin to assign the positions of the atoms with a lot of confidence and go to better than one angstrom resolution, so 0 0.8 angstrom resolution and in this structure you can see you can fit every atom almost perfectly. You can see the individual atoms uh, as spheres rather than the overall outline of the structure uh, as a blob.
quite a lot of structures determined by electron microscopy are at a lot lower resolution. And in these structures, the models might simply indicate the location or the orientation of the protein within um, a much larger complex, typically. So this is a 37 angstrom resolution map by electron microscopy of ATPase. And the purpose of this paper is to show the role of how the ATPase shape the mitochondrial membrane. So actually, the purpose of this study was to indicate that angle between the two molecules. And clearly, you would not want to use this structure to measure a hydrogen bond or a particular distance between two atoms. So it's important to look at the resolution and appreciate what the authors are trying to tell from the structure. So moving on to the residue property plots in the validation report, which are listed per polymer chain. And this gives a color coding of each residue according to the number of geometric outliers that there might be, so the quality of the model. And the residue is colored green if there are no outliers, um, from then through yellow through to red if the residue has three or more uh, geometric outliers in it. Uh, and these outliers are listed on the right-hand side, bond lengths or angles, chiralities, uh, close contacts, Ramachandran or side chain outliers, and for RNAs, the pucker of the sugar ring. And of course, because there are um, many atoms in an amino acid, there can be more than one bond length or angle outlier per residue. And the graphic has two parts to it, a summary bar chart at the top, where um, you can see for this structure, 63% have no geometric outliers, 34 one per residue, etc. And then the little bar at the top says 7% of residues um, do not fit the electron density. And in the, the larger graphic, you get the issues per residue. So we only highlight residues that have issues. Uh, you see, for instance, right in the middle, there's a long green bar, horizontal green bar between I47 and F53, that's those residues in between have no problems, so we've not shown them. It's easy in a report that only highlights errors to con conclude that everything is bad, but of course you don't see all the things here that are perfectly good. And the red dot above that graphic is equal to the 7% in the upper graphic that highlights um, amino acids which have a poor fit to the electron density for X-ray structures, i.e., as we said before, an RSRZ outlier. At PDBE, we can validate that information. There's the summary graphic and the summary sliders. And if we go to 3D visualization, then here we can see the structure in three dimensions. It's rotatable on the web page and go to the validation report on the left, on the right-hand side, and then color it by those geometric outliers that we saw in the previous graphic. And at the bottom, click on a residue to view the data. So we'll click on an amino acid, zoom in, and there we see the electron density. Um, in the previous images, I've shown it as wireframe. This is a more solid representation, but you can change it between the two. So you can look here and see for yourself how well the amino acid fits the electron density. On our pages as well, there's a more uh, extensive graphic, so scroll down for each molecule. Uh, this is the HIV protease. Click on molecule details. It takes you to a page with more information. And there we see uh, 1D sequence information and the quality graphic hover over a residue and it will tell you what the issue is with that uh, amino acid. So there, there's a bond angle outlier on that, and the red dot indicates uh, poor fit to density. Topology diagram does the same thing. Hover over an amino acid, it tells you what the issue might be. And also in three dimensions, as we saw on the last page, you can color three-dimensional structure by the validation report. And all these three graphics are interactive. So click on one, it highlights it in any of the others. This residue here has a poor fit to data. It says that it's an RSRZ outlier. So click on it, 
zoom in in the three dimensions, click on it in 3D, shows the electron density, and it's this methionine here, and you can see actually there is no data to support the position of that methionine. We know there's a methionine there, but it's probably highly mobile in the structure, so the data averages out when you don't see it. So it's important to take that into account uh, if you're modeling that that amino acid, we can't be sure of exactly where those atoms are. That was the quality of the FIT to data and the data quality for X-ray structures. For NMR structures, the report also has some indication of these uh, metrics, although at the moment it's relatively basic. The report will give you the completeness of the resonance assignments, so the percentage of atoms for which chemical shifts, chemical shift is the frequency at which the atom resonates in a magnetic field, that's the percentage of atoms for which that chemical shift is measured. And we list uh, statistically unusual chemical shifts. We know typically what we would expect them to be. So if something is a long way from that mean value, it's, mean, it's flagged up as unusual. Again, unusual doesn't mean wrong. It's just worth looking at. And then the fit to the data, we give the random coil index, which asks the question, does the frequency of the uh, atom, the chemical shift, and the confirmation of the protein in the final structure, do those two things agree? So you get this graph in the validation report where the y-axis is the likelihood of disorder. So the chemical shifts indicate that the amino acid isn't in regular secondary structure. And the color of the bar uh, gives you whether in the model the residue is ordered or not. So the take-home message is cyan bars should be tall, black bars should not be tall. And you can see this structure is up in the top right-hand corner. The cyan bars are all at the end terminus, which is disordered in the NMR ensemble. For electron microscopy ent entries, the validation report doesn't yet contain data quality or the fit to data, uh, but this information is available on our pages in EMDB uh, at EBI's website. And there's a lot of technical information here, which I won't go into today for reasons of time, but if people are interested, we might come back and revisit this in a future webinar. So it's important to note that uh, the geometry of a residue and the fit to data go hand in hand. You can't assume that uh, a geometric outlier means the structure is wrong without supporting data. So this is PDB entry 3 KSE, and in this structure, valine 48 is a Ramachandran outlier. Um, the graphic here is colored by the validation report from our web pages. You'll see it's yellow, so there's one geometric outlier here. But we know from the literature and highly supported by the electron density in this structure that that strained conformation is well supported by the data. On the other hand, in the same entry, aspartate 62 has some outlier bond lengths, but you can see the electron density here is very poor. They're not justified by the data, so it's highly likely that that's a slight error in the building of the, mod of the model. Before we move on, uh, an aside on assemblies in the PDB. It's the convention for crystallographers that only the smallest part of a crystal structure is deposited in the PDB. And the whole can be generated by applying symmetry to this. So if your bathroom is tiled, you only need to give me one tile and I can work out what the rest of the uh, bathroom looks like. All you have to tell me is how the tiles are arranged what's on the tile may differ. So the part you're interested in might be the file that you download from the PDB as it is. It might be the file, but you have to apply some symmetry to generate a relevant part. Or it might actually be only a part of the file. So it might only be that bit. And it's important that you work with uh, the right thing. So again, this is HIV protease. In entry 2AZ9, 
if you download the file from the PDB, this is what you get. However, HIV protease is a dimer, so if you're working on ligand docking studies, it's vitally important that you work with this dimeric structure because the substrate and lots of inhibitors bind in the middle between them. So if you only worked on that structure, you'd be only getting half the picture. Our viewer at PDB enables you to show the assemblies as they're annotated in the structure. So if we go here to source, you can view either the assembly or add symmetry. If you put symmetry on, it shows you the whole array of molecules as they're arranged in the crystal. And then turn it to assembly. That will give you the list of annotated assemblies, in this case only the one um, in the structure. So this gives you the dimer of HIV protease, and in the middle there, you can see the small molecule inhibitor. So talking of small molecule inhibitors, this brings us on to the validation for small molecules. And in the early parts of the validation report, you get this table, which gives you a summary of issues for small molecules. So this is uh, small molecule 3TL, all ligands in the PDB get a three-character code, and it's residue 200 in chain A. And there are four boxes which give you a high-level overview of whether or not there might be problems with this ligand. So chirality, is it the correct handedness? Uh, I don't need to stress that particularly for drugs, giving the right chirality of the molecule is absolutely vital. The geometry, is it chemically sensible? Are there bond length outliers? Are there angle outliers? Clashes, is it banging into anything? And electron density for X-ray structures, so does it fit the electron density? Does it fit the data? Of course, for amino acids and nucleic acids in the PDB, there are thousands of them. They're extremely well characterized, and we can tell you a lot about them, and we can say how well an, an amino acid fits the data compared to all the others in the PDB. We can say geometrically how good it is compared to um, thousands of well-characterized molecules. A small molecule in the PDB could be completely unique. Uh, last week in the PDB, the structure of a GPCR with LSD bound was released. That's the first time we've seen LSD in the PDB. So how do we know what it looks like? We don't have anything to compare it to in our archive. Fortunately, this is where our colleagues up the road in the Cambridge Crystallographic Data Center come in handy. They have some software called Mogul, which queries their database of small molecule crystal structures and can tell us how well the molecule fits compared to similar fragments. So there is a knowledge base library of geometry derived from their database of millions of small molecule crystal structures. So what we can do is take a small molecule in the PDB and compare it to molecules in the Cambridge Structural Database which have uh, similar fragments, so we can compare the bond lengths and bond angles to those. And that's what we do for small molecules. So for a given molecule, we'll query the CSD and say, for molecules that have similar architecture, this particular bond length has this distribution, clusters very tightly around 1.4 angstroms. So in our particular structure, if we measure the bond length to be 1.95, that probably indicates there might be a problem with that modeling. And in detail in the validation report, we give this information. You can see major issues are highlighted in yellow. Uh, the bond lengths overall are nearly three standard deviations away from the mean, and 17 of them are more than two standard deviations away. And similarly for bond angles. That's the first part of validation. Is the molecule chemically sensible? The second part is the fit to data. So the RSR we discussed earlier, how well the residue fits its local density. 
and a value of greater than 0.5 means it's worth a second look. We can't give an RSR Z because we don't have enough small molecules quite often. So the RSRZ we said for amino acids was how well does your arginine fit the data compared with all other arginines, but we can't say how well does LSD fit the data compared to all other LSDs in the PDB because we only have the one of them as of last week. So we have this metric called the local ligand density fit, which is a Z score of uh, the ligand fit to data compared with its binding site and greater than a value of two is flagged as unusual. LLDF isn't a perfect metric, but it's very useful in flagging up issues. So it asks the question, is the ligand data comparable to that of the binding site? And for this particular example I've shown, this is diclofenac, the painkiller. You can see the LLDF has a value of nearly 16 and a half when I said greater than two is flagged as unusual. Uh, there are many other metrics in here which I'm not going to go into, but the validation report um, describes these in detail. If you're interested, it's well worth reading the reports and the help text that goes with them. And this is the electron density for that diclofenac molecule in that PDB entry. And you can see that actually there is a very uh, sparse electron density. It's been built into almost no data at all. So there is no blue chicken wire around those atoms to support their presence. You'll also see, and you may have noticed on some of the earlier slides of electron density, there are regions of red and regions of green electron density. What are the red and green bits? Well, because you need the model to properly calculate the map, um, they indicate um, positions where the model and the map don't agree. So conventionally, these are colored red and green, which probably tells you that very few crystallographers are colorblind. The red areas indicate where the model has too many atoms for the data. So the data is saying, I don't want atoms positioned here. And conversely, the green areas are where the model has too few atoms for the data. So the data suggests more atoms should be placed there. This is a tryptophan residue. If you look carefully, um, up in the top right, there are too many atoms for the data, and in the bottom left, there are too few atoms for the data. There's a clear solution for this. Actually, the tryptophan has been modeled in the wrong orientation. Turn it round, and it fits the data perfectly. But the difference density can indicate errors in building the model. Um, so this is a cytochrome P450, the heme group, and you can see that green blob right above the iron in the heme. Well, could that indicate there's a ligand bound that hasn't been modeled? One has to be careful with difference density and assess the level of noise. You can't build things into noise in the data. Um, but that might indicate that there could be something there. Another entry here, there's a very large green blob in this structure, uh, there might be something else there that hasn't been modeled. In fact, I know from this structure, um, the authors have said there is something else there, but they don't know what it is. So this is green density that says the, the data suggests there should be more atoms in the model. Uh, conversely, red electron density uh, indicates the, the data does not support the position of these atoms. So this is an aspirin uh, structure in the PDB, and you can see it fits remarkably well into red density, which is shouting, don't put atoms here. So its presence isn't supported by the data. Uh, and also a key clue is it's not interacting with the protein very much. So as well as the fit to data, look at the binding site and see, does it make chemical sense? A, a small molecule can't be bound to a protein if it's not actually touching it. And viewing ligands at PDBE, every ligand has its own page. If you click on the ligand on each entry page, you take taken to a further page. There's lots of information about the small molecule, and then scroll down a 2D diagram of the ligand binding site, and 3D. Uh, interactive viewer where you can see the molecule 
and the electron density for an X-ray structure uh, to judge for yourself whether it's supported by the data. So our time is coming to an end. This has been a whistle-stop tour, a summary of validation and what we're doing about it in the worldwide PDB and how you can view it at PDBE. Uh, assessing the quality of macromolecular structures is not a black and white issue. It's not easy to say whether a structure is good or a structure is bad. I think as a general rule, if all the metrics on the sliders are right at the red end, then you should use that structure with a great deal of care. If all the metrics are on the blue end, use it with a lot more confidence. But there may be some outliers that are completely justified, and in which case it's well worth reading the paper if there's a paper available that describes the structure. Are those outliers talked about in this paper? Does the model fit the data? And crucially, does the structure adequately explain what's known biologically? There have been several cases where a structure doesn't fit biological experiments and the structure's been revisited and shown that it's been the data's been interpreted wrongly. The WWPDB validation reports are extensive. They go into lots of detail and they're a very good aid to identifying uh, the structure quality. Here at Protein Data Bank in Europe, our search results rank structures by the quality, taking into account the validation metrics and for X-ray entries, the resolution of the structure, the precision with which you can fit the atoms. And our pages at PDBE allow the validation information to be viewed in three dimensions, uh, along with the data for EM and X-ray entries. You can see the maps for both of those techniques. Uh, we also have a PyMol plugin, if PyMol is your viewer of choice, uh, to colour the ribbon by this, the geometrical outliers, the same as we have on our website, and that's available from the PyMol wiki. So thank you very much. It uh, falls for me to thank our collaborators and our funders, and we'll move back, uh, hand back to Adam to take questions now. Matthew, thank you very much. That was a really interesting talk. So on behalf of everyone here, thank you very much indeed. Um, so the floor is now open for questions. If anyone has a question for Matthew, um, I would ask you to type it into the, the question area at the side of uh, GoToWebinar. The panel may look very slightly different to the one shown here. Um, I think, uh, but you'll have a, a similar area of questions where you should be able to type a question if you have one. Um, while they're coming in, uh, I, I guess uh, I could ask a, a quick question to get things going, Matthew. So yeah. this, the, this validation data looks like very useful data in its own right. I, I might have missed it at the start. Is the validation data written back to the central um, data bank uh, as well, or is this just stored uh, alongside the, the things that go on the website? It's, no, it's available in the FTP area, which is the central archive um, that all the sites host, uh, both as the PDFs and as XML. So it's available, it's a separate file to the model file, but it is available uh, centrally, yes. Okay, that's, that's good. And, and how often is the, the validation done? Is that sort of done continuously uh, as so, things are uploaded or...? Yes, it's recal. I said, um, it, I think I said, I don't remember. It's recalculated every year uh, for the okay. whole archive, because as new structures come in, those percentile plots will change. Because a structure that is in the hundredth percentile today might fall down in ranking next week when you know, 300 new structures that are better arrive. It's calculated. Um, as, as entries come in, we calculate it and give it back to the depositors before the data go live. So okay. people submit yeah. their data up to a year before it goes live, and quite often, based on those, those reports, they might go away and revise the structure. Okay. Great. So I'm looking for any other 
questions from the floor? Do we have any more? Don't be shy, either on the content of the, the presentation itself or on any related matters that you want to, to ask us while well, well, he's here. While you have a tame structural biologist at your back of the call, <laughs> make use of me. OK, well, I'll just ask uh, one more then, while I, just in case we can persuade anyone else to ask a question. Um, so it's it's really interesting to, to have all the, the quality data now associated with the, the structural data itself. Uh, do you notice sort of patterns of improving quality over time um, as as this, these other things have been available to check the results that have gone into the database? Do you see that there have been improvements? Yeah. Yes, we do. Um, it's most related. The validation report uses a lot of external software, which is also available in the community and is integrated into many of the refinement software that structural biologists use to generate their structures. So we see a lot of leaps in structure quality as that gets integrated into the refinement software, um, which itself has got much better over the years. So if I were to re-refine a structure that was deposited 10 years ago in modern software, it would automatically get better. OK, yes, that's uh, interesting to, to see. Um, so we do have a question from uh, Mitro. Mitro, um, do you want to speak to the speaker? Directly, are you able to? Do you have a, a microphone? Are you able to answer your question? If so, please go ahead. Uh, otherwise, I'll read your your question out. Okay, I'm not hearing at the moment from Mitra, so I'll read out the question. Mitra was asking, um, what's the easiest way? Oh, sorry, what's the easiest way of knowing if a hetero atoms such as zinc or magnesium is oriented correctly in, let's say, active center of an enzyme? There is, there is no easy way from the reports. This is something we don't validate, and that's very difficult to validate because it's, it tends to be um, case specific. Um, that's something that you would have to look at very carefully, knowing for metal ions, knowing what the typical coordination angles were and seeing if that was sensible. It's not something we do at the moment. Some of that could be done in the future, but at the moment it's not there. So I think um, talk to your friendly chemist or your friendly structural biologist is the best way of knowing that uh, for a particular case. Okay, thank you, Matthew, and thank you for the question, Mitra. Um, Anyone else just now? If not, then we're uh, approaching the top of the hour. So um, in, I would just like to say thank you all for coming along. Um, Matthew, if you could advance to the final slide, uh, I would just like to take this opportunity to advertise our next webinar. Um, this takes place on the, the 15th of February at 3 o'clock GMT. So notice that's one hour later than, than this week's webinar. Uh, the title is Robust Solutions for Cryo-EM Fitting and Visualization of Interaction Space. And that talk will be given by Guido van Zundert with some of um, my colleagues here in the BioXL project as well, Mikhail and Jörg. So if you'd like to find out more about that webinar or indeed uh, find recordings of this webinar and previous webinars, you can find out more at the website bioexcel.eu slash webinars. Thank you all for coming along today and thank you very much indeed Matthew for your talk. Um, I hope you. you all found it interesting and uh, we will hopefully get the chance to speak to you all again soon.